over to Dr. Ramanan. I already introduced Dr. Ramanan. He's a pediatric rheumatologist from Bristol Royal Hospital Children. And I think he's involved in many studies and many clinical trials all over the world. Over to Dr. Ramanan. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thangavelu, and thank you for uh, Dr. SBS for inviting me. You can hear me fine, can't you? Yeah, yeah. I can hear yeah. you and see your slides. And you can see the screen. Thank you very much. Um, I've only joined for the last talk, so my apologies if um, I'm repeating some of what's already been mentioned. After that um, excellent exposition by uh, Dr. SBS, I'm not sure what I'm going to add. What I've decided to do in these um, uh, 20 plus minutes is try and tell you what lessons we have learned uh, because of my involvement in the recovery trials in adults, as well as um, try and give you some guidance on whether you can use steroids as first line. So um, this is the pathophysiology and I'm sure it's been addressed uh, by previous speakers, so I won't dwell on it, but one of the reasons we know that primary COVID is uh, uh, of low incidence in children is we believe due to the ACE2 um, receptor disposition. We also know that type one interferon is a pivotal cytokine, which is key for antiviral responses. And we know from adults who die uh, using genetic studies that a blunted type one interferon uh, response or having anti-interferon antibodies is what gives you severe COVID. And this might have some, um, in answer to um, Dr. SBS's first question, is there a genetic predisposition? We may think uh, that there is, and we'll, I'll come to that again. And then whether it's severe COVID and primary COVID with uh, respiratory symptoms or in MIS-C, the damage is mediated by an overdrive um, of the immune system with the release of a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is what you're targeting with either IVIG or tocilizumab or steroids. So this probably has already been addressed. Primary COVID, which is COVID involving the lungs as it affects adults, is extremely rare. Most of the children uh, do have symptoms which are very mild, which is why there are major dilemmas on whether to vaccinate kids when uh, COVID itself is not a condition which causes significant morbidity or mortality. And I'll show you some preprint data on what the morbidity and mortality is in the UK context. So UK is probably almost the size of Tamil Nadu. So this being a Tamil Nadu um, uh, pediatric uh, society, you can have some level of extrapolation. Um, in answer to the question, we think that SARS-CoV-2 related MIS-C might actually give us some clues in understanding Kawasaki, even though, as it's been pointed out to you in the previous lecture, there are some similarities and there are some differences. We know that a lot of people get exposed to the uh, virus. Why is it only a tiny number of children go on to get this multi-system inflammatory syndrome? And the clues will certainly lie in the genetics. Even though we haven't got the answers yet, I'm fairly confident in the next um, 12 to 24 months, this disease will enable us to understand more about the immune interactions between the immune system and the virus than three decades of research in Kawasaki. This has already been pointed out that there are certainly some similarities with Kawasaki, while there are some distinct differences. And I think the differences is what you need to focus on. The fact that most of the kids with MIS-C tend to be above the age of five. And if you see someone under the age of five, you treat them as you would treat Kawasaki. The significant GI involvement, which was shown to you in the KKCTH um, uh, uh, cohort is what's been seen in the UK cohort and worldwide as well. And the significant proportion of kids presenting with shock and cardiac dysfunction, again, is um, at odds with what we see with Kawasaki. So this is preprint data, but I'm gonna show you, this is just hot off the press. We're gonna look at deaths in children and young people in England, which is just a population of about 55 million during the SARS-CoV-2 infection in the first year. So this data was cut off at about February, which is um, at the peak of um, our uh, second wave. So in fact, what we are showing here is that there were only 25 deaths in the period from March 2020 to end of February 2021 in children, which is reassuring compared to the huge number of deaths in adults. And this 25 is between both primary COVID infection and with um, uh, MIS-C. We call it uh, pediatric inflammatory multisystem syndrome temporarily associated with COVID-19. We were the first in the world um, to identify MIS-C, and that's why this name stuck. Uh, and we put out an alert in April, and I was part of the Royal College group, which did this. 
uh, but I think Missy is a much better term. And if you see, most of these, um, these are primary uh, COVID deaths in those with life-limiting neurodisability and those with other life-limiting conditions. So these are probably children and young adolescents with severe immunosuppression or severe neurological problems, which means they will have a compromised respiratory system and therefore are highly susceptible for a primary COVID uh, pneumonitis. Um, and really some of the other things we worried about initially, such as asthma, hasn't been a problem, or those who are, have ALL and are on um, uh, chemotherapy. So what we are showing here is all deaths in the same um, one year period. They looked at actually a five year period, but mainly this March, 2020, which is when we started recognizing cases, the February, 2021, which will be cut off. And then these, the uh, orange line is deaths in um, children with positive uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and, and the bottom line is that mortality from all forms of COVID, whether it's primary COVID or MIS-C, is extraordinarily rare and low, which is why there is a huge ethical question on whether vaccination is the right way forward when the impact of this virus in children is of such a low magnitude. And of these 25, and it's only a small number, of these 25 deaths, the main uh, ones are in the age group of 10 to 17. And that's the age group where both Miss C predominates, as well as you have some children um, who are uh, severely disabled from uh, uh, genetic neurological conditions, as well as other life limiting conditions. But what is interesting, and this comes back to the issue with India is, um, in UK, we have out of a population of um, 65 million, about three and a half to four million who are of Indian, Pakistani or Bangladeshi origin. And, and then another uh, million uh, of Afro-Caribbean origin. And we see that the mortality is disproportionate in these two ethnicities. So whether there are underlying genetic predispositions or whether these are just socioeconomic variables, we don't know, but it's certainly something that will become more apparent. And that has some important implications for um, uh, us in India, because if there are genetic predispositions from those of Indian origin, then we need to understand better and more, uh, be more vigilant for Missy. So the next preprint paper I'm going to show you, and I'm going to only summarize it, was the risk factors for intensive care admission and death in all children, again, in the period from March 2020 to February 2021. <coughs> and the summary of this is in this period of almost 10 months, we had 6,000 hospital admissions. These are 6,000 hospital admissions for children, of which there were 2,250 uh, PICU admissions and eight deaths from primary COVID. If you take MIS-C, we had about 700 hospital admissions, about 300 of which were in PICU and less than five deaths. So this gives you a, a further reflection. And as I said, um, the uh, this data is, uh, for England and England's population is about 55 million. So just, I would say that's five and a half crores. So not far off from the size of Tamil Nadu. So this is what one can expect um, for Tamil Nadu as well. You probably will have a slightly higher, younger population. So what I'm gonna do now is even though we are pediatricians, most of you will get sucked into treating adult COVID or getting requests from friends and family about how to manage adult COVID. And I want to dispel some myths because in the last 10 months, people use a load of medications in adult primary COVID from which we derive the evidence base for pediatric COVID. So this was the original recovery protocol. When COVID first hit our shows in March 2020, we wanted to study these four drugs. These were drugs which people thought might work, an antiretroviral, steroids, hydroxychloroquine, and azithromycin, and those who didn't respond to a randomization in this, tocilizumab or not tocilizumab. Then we went on to look at convalescent plasma, continuing with tocilizumab. Then we went on to look at the Regeneron. Um, there are two monoclonal antibodies. One is the Regeneron, which I think is approved for emergency use in India. And another one is the Lilies. I've been involved in studies of both of those in one form or fashion. And we also looked at colchicine as well as low dose aspirin. And I'm gonna summarize all of this. And all of these studies are in adults. The first one, and this report really revolutionized the management of uh, COVID across the world. And this came from the recovery trial in UK. And what they showed was if you had dexamethasone, you had a significant reduction in um, mortality. But this reduction in mortality was only if you were on oxygen or on ventilation or any form of therapy beyond oxygen. So 
if you are PCR positive and an adult with COVID, but you're not requiring oxygen, you do not need steroids. But if you need oxygen, then steroids will significantly reduce your mortality or your need for ventilation um, or further care. And, and that's what I'm showing here using the odds ratio saying that if you had dexamethasone versus just having supportive care, then you had much lower incidence of mechanical ventilation. But if you didn't need oxygen, you didn't need steroids. And in fact, there was a trend for harm in terms of side effects in patients who were PCR positive, had COVID, but didn't need oxygen. So the moral of the story is do not take steroids if you do not need oxygen or any other form of supportive care. And what we showed, and this was published about six months ago by my colleagues, but we showed that since the dexamethasone data um, was published in UK alone, we've managed to um, avoid 73,000 um, deaths. So we have saved at least 12,000 lives and about 100,000 life years gained for a very small uh, proportion of cost because dexamethasone is a generic drug. So probably in the last year, the drug which has saved a lot of lives is steroids, but do not use steroids if you do not have um, significant illness and significant illness is classed as needing uh, oxygen therapy or needing ventilation. I don't need to remind any of you about the hype surrounding hydroxychloroquine. And this is a, a large study we uh, published showing that when 1,561 adults were randomized to hydroxychloroquine versus 3,000 to standard of care alone, there was no difference in the 28 day mortality showing hydroxychloroquine does not have any role to play in primary COVID-19 infection. So among hospitalized patients with COVID-19, there is no difference in mortality between those who received hydroxychloroquine and those who got just supportive care. Next is the retroviral combination. Again, no difference between standard of care and those who got the retroviral for 28 day mortality. So this again is an ineffective therapy, do not use. Azithromycin, and I know loads of hospitals around the world still use azithromycin. This is again a large randomized control trial from the recovery uh, group. 2,500 patients in the azithromycin group, 5,000 in standard of care. Absolutely zero difference in 28 day mortality showing there is no role for use of azithromycin. So just to recap, I've said no role for hydroxychloroquine, no role for retroviral, no role for azithromycin. I know most of you um, know of stories of people scrambling to get convalescent plasma. And this randomized control trial has just been published about six weeks ago, again from the recovery trial group. What they did was they took almost 6,000 patients were allocated to the convalescent plasma group another 6,000 to standard of care. So these are large samples, not just 10, 20 or 50 patients. 28 day mortality. And this is high teeter convalescent plasma because someone would ask is the teeter low? All patients had high teeter convalescent plasma. And there is no difference in 28 day mortality between the hospitalized patients with COVID-19 who got convalescent plasma to those who just got standard of care. So this is a 11,000 patient study clearly demonstrating there is absolutely no role for convalescent plasma. Colchicine, there was a lot of uh, hype around colchicine because of one Canadian study. This again is preprint, but it's going to come out any time now. 5,000 plus patients randomized to colchicine compared to 5,000 plus patients to usual care. No difference between the group which got colchicine to the group which got just supportive care in either 28 day mortality, duration of hospital stay, or the need for ventilation. Again, colchicine is ineffective. It might be inexpensive, but it's ineffective as well. And then this is the Regeneron's uh, monoclonal antibody um, uh, uh, cocktail, which uh, if given early, there was a lot of uh, promise. And I know of some famous American um, uh, personalities like the previous president got this. This study is slightly relevant to us as pedi uh, pediatricians because it did include children about the age of 12. This again is from recovery and I was um, associated with it closely. So they took 10,000 patients who were randomized to usual care or usual care plus this region around monoclonal antibody. And what's important here is half of these patients were seropositive at baseline and a third of the patients were seronegative. And in about 15% of the patients, we didn't know the antibody status. And what this study shows 
is if the monoclonal antibodies are given early, when you are zero negative, then you certainly will have an impact in reducing mortality. But it has to be given early and it has to be given in zero negative. The zero negativity goes with being given early because you haven't had a chance to mount an immune response. But it's an highly expensive therapy. Nonetheless, it does show a reduction in 28 day mortality. And this is the region Ron cocktail. I have no reason to believe that the Lily's um, monoclonal antibody will also be similar. Then come the uh, um, uh, major immunosuppressants, tocilizumab. And everyone at this time, including Lapris, was talking about the immune overdrive and the cytokine storm you see in association. Why IL-6? It's a perfect cytokine to target in, um, in primary COVID infection because we know that IL-6 has a major role uh, in elevation of um, CRP, working on the liver and the hepatocytes. It leads to the increased thromboembolic manifestations that adults with uh, COVID-19 get because it increases the um, VEGF and increases the vascular permeability and causing um, a, a vasculitis or a vasculopathy. It acts on the complement pathway and it activates the clotting cascade as well. So I'm gonna to only touch on uh, three major trials which unequivocally show that after steroids in July, 2020, the next drug which has been shown conclusively to reduce mortality is IL-6 blockade. And the first one is again a UK and Netherlands based study, but the bulk of patients are recruited in UK. Here they recruited patients, mainly adults who are in ICU. And they looked at tocilizumab versus sarilumab and other IL-6 blockade versus control. And the primary outcome was seeing if they can have an impact on death, as well as days free of organ support. They had 350 patients to tocilizumab, only a small number to sarilumab. But these are all very sick in intensive care, and they had to be within 24 hours of being ventilated. The mortality was 28% in the tocilizumab group, 22% in the sarilumab group, but 35% in those who did not get IL-6 blockade, thereby showing that IL-6 blockade on top of dexamethasone reduced mortality by a further eight and a half percent. So this is additive to dexamethasone. And the, this was in very severely ill patients, whereas recovery trial took 2000 patients in the tocilizumab arm compared with 2000 who got only standard of care. And they showed that for every 25 patients you treat with tocilizumab, one additional life will be saved. And this is on top of dexamethasone. 80% of these 4,000 patients received dexamethasone. It also had an impact on the need for oxygen and mechanical ventilation, and it reduced um, uh, the demand for mechanical ventilation if you manage to give tocilizumab early in the illness when they only need oxygen. We also did a randomized control trial, which I was part of with Arvinder Soyan, which we published in The Lancet, which was 180 patients, and we replicated showing that in the severely ill patients, if you give tocilizumab early, this was done across multiple hospitals, including in uh, Apollo and Chennai, showing um, similar to the other data. This is a study which we just published two weeks ago, which I was part of. It's a WHO uh, meta-analysis of all the studies. And if I summarize it, there was a total of 10,000 patients from 27 trials. And using complex statistics, we showed that all of them together have the same effect, that IL-6 blockade is associated with a reduced 28-day mortality. So WHO has come up with very few uh, positive um, trial evidence for uh, uh, therapies after steroids. The next one is IL-6, where they've clearly shown the meta-analysis that it does reduce 28-day mortality. And then comes JAK kinase inhibitors. Why were we interested in JNS kinase inhibitors? Because we think they're only anti-cytokine because they block a host of cytokines, including gamma interferon and IL-6, but they also may have a putative antiviral uh, role by acting through these AC or NUM kinases. So I was part of a large um, Ramash control trial, which was run across the world. This paper is about to come out in the Lancet in the next couple of weeks. This is the preprint data, which I'm authorized to show you. It's a 1,500 patient study showing that when baricitinib was given on top of um, dexamethasone, there was an additive 38% reduction in mortality. So I know the cost of baricitinib has come really down in India and you can get it for 40 rupees for a 14 day course. It will probably only be 500 rupees. So if you need oxygen and you've tried steroids, baricitinib is a much better drug than tocilizumab, which is expensive and hard to access. 
So what about uh, children? Um, Dr. SBS has already pointed out to you that we wrote this recent editorial in Lancet. And I firmly believe uh, that IVIG was used in MISI only because we saw the features of Kawasaki. Perhaps had we started using steroids, we would have seen the same responses as we're seeing with IVIG. IVIG is expensive, it's in short supply, and a lot of children with MIS-C are older, so you will need to use large doses. They may be 30, 40, 50 kilos, costing huge amounts of money, whereas steroids is safer and cheaper. So I will show you a host of retrospective data to back up my argument. This is a French data where uh, they divided the patients into two groups, those who got IVIG versus those who got IVIG plus steroids. And then they used complex statistics using propensity scores. If you give somebody IVIG plus steroids, it means you're more worried about them, but you can factor that in your stats analysis. And what they did in this 100 plus patients is divide them into a third who got just, um, a third who got both steroids and IVIG and two thirds who got IVIG. And they showed that if you're very ill, IVIG plus IV methylprid, exactly as was pointed out to you in the previous talk in their um, life-threatening patients, work much better. It decreased the uh, intensive care stay. But the question we want to answer is, would these patients have done as well by just getting steroids? And that's the point um, that Mike Levine, my colleague in London, was trying to address in this paper, which was published four weeks ago in New England Journal of Medicine. And this again uses complex um, statistics. It takes a whole host of almost um, thousand children from all across the world. It's a retrospective study and it takes into account whether they've had steroids and then IVIG or IVIG and then steroids and other drugs. And what they um, divide them into groups of IVIG alone, IVIG plus steroids, steroids alone and other immunomodulators. And is there a, um, any differences in the um, uh, age adjusted Z scores? Uh, nothing massive. Uh, but, and the SARS-CoV-2 antibody positivity rate is similar in all of them, about uh, 70 to 80% are antibody positive, as you would expect in MIS-C. And what they're showing here is if you compare IVIG plus steroids versus IVIG alone, certainly these patients uh, recover earlier, they need lesser support uh, either uh, in intensive care or with inotropes, and less complications and less mortality. Um, and that's the time to stop inotropes, time to stop ventilation, time to stop oxygen um, are all better in the group which got both drugs versus just IVIG alone. But the comparison we're most interested in is steroids alone versus IVIG alone. And those who got steroids alone did show a trend, a clear trend to having less inotrope support, less um, mechanical ventilation or getting weaned from mechanical ventilation shown much easier in this showing that um, those who got IVIG alone took longer to stop inotropes, took longer to stop ventilation, needed oxygen for longer, and were, uh, in terms of severity, both groups were similar. So I would put it to you that it's not just in those who are economically disadvantaged, but in anybody about the age of five, IV steroids or oral steroids is as effective as IV um, uh, IG alone. So we are doing a large trial. We have um, recruited more than 275 children. And I think by end of August or early September, we'll have the results. What we do here is we took all kids um, with uh, Miss C in UK. And at entry, they will either get usual care or IVIG or IV methyl prednisolone. And for those who are not better after 24 hours with the first line randomization, they can then enter or immediately even if the um, physicians worried to either tocilizumab or anakindra or usual care on a two is to two is to one allocation to make it more attractive for families to participate in the study. So this is a pictorial design for uh, anybody entering uh, the recovery pediatric trial with MIS-C. You will either be randomized to no treatment or to IV methylprednisolone 10 milligram per kilogram for three days or IVIG two grams per kilogram. And for those who are persistently febrile or have a CRP of more than 75, you can enter the second randomization of anakindra or tocilizumab or um, standard of care. As I say, we have recruited almost 275 children. We are doing our final data clearing. And I hope if I'm invited again, I'll be able to show you the results, which hopefully will conclusively demonstrate that an inexpensive drug such as steroids is as effective, if not more effective than IVIG. I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you very much again for your invitation and apologies for overlap with other speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Anand. Brought on very nice, a uh, lot of analysis, analyze almost every drug used in 
covid both in acute covid as well as in mic and brought out a fantastic uh, support from your clinical trials differently if you are going to say that uh, steroid is equally effective like ivag in children above 5 years and uh, echo doesn't show coronary artery aneurysm will be too happy to have it because is mic is a disease present with very serious illness they recover faster within 4 5 days but the parents are very unhappy and even the amount they can't face the burden of financial burdens if you say that probably steroids are equally effective it will be a great uh, blessing for all these uh, kids and their parents uh, I, we have some questions so do you have any long term problem with tosilizumab no um like, tosilizumab uh, stays incidence of tuberculosis or infection all that long yeah, term so the tb question i can't answer only because we have very low endemicity for tb yeah, in a country like india where but i would not expect a huge problem because you're only giving a single dose um, and it tends to get um, uh, uh, with a half life probably within 4 to 6 weeks you've completely left the system the only thing i would do is avoid giving vaccinations for about 3 months uh, in order to um, prevent a blunted vaccine response in the children who get tocilizumab you would avoid vaccines for 3 months the theoretical risk of tocilizumab aggravating tuberculosis is very small because in uh, messi we are going to give one dose okay uh, and uh, you know most severe messies are all either well nourished or obese children they are not mal nourished children with high propensity for tuberculosis and of course in a child who has got a severe messy you first worry about saving the life than about tuberculosis yeah, immediate we had a mini epidemic of mucormycosis in india including kids adult and kids are affected did you see mucormycosis in, in your population or other western country population what could be the reason for mucormycosis in our country that's a fascinating question actually because initially when there was a huge incidence of mucormycosis people said it's because there were a lot of them were diabetics but the proportion of diabetics in the in the 35000 plus adults recruited to recovery is 30% similar to the proportion of diabetics in india so it's not more or less but we don't see much mucor so um i'm not sure if uh, the reasons could be um more uh, local such as greater background prevalence of mucor probably new onset diabetes i'm just speculating and probably more indiscriminate use of steroids for longer periods here we just give steroids only if you need oxygen and that was only till discharge so you don't get steroids if you're not on oxygen there is another question is from uh, professor ramanan how do you justify no treatment arm in your current study yeah so um you know in a this is um as uh, dr s b s pointed out our experience as well is in the um child or adolescent presenting with missy who is not in shock there are about 1/5 of the patients who settle spontaneously okay we have um limited evidence on what the long term outcomes are both um, from a quantitative echo and qualitative but the uk system allows us to do this sort of randomization to address and get questions but imagine um 15 months ago it was thought unethical to not give hydroxychloroquine if you got covid we have now shown by doing trials it doesn't work 12 months ago everybody was hunting for convalescent plasma and it would have been considered unethical to randomize them to plasma versus no plasma now we have shown it doesn't work and i think we can make progress only by doing randomized control trials but with appropriate safeguards so um, and i think the discretion for randomizing a patient into a trial is always with the pediatrician if the pediatrician is concerned that this patient needs treatment because it's life threatening they wouldn't randomize the patient to the trial they would go as per normal and there are enough ways of um, uh, still recruiting to the study even if you've managed to give one dose of the, or the other Dr. Tanvela, I want yes. to add something here. Yes, yes sir. Mm. Uh, in fact, mm. like you, I like any disease where the role of the clinician is, is most important. 
So I like Missy that way. Yeah. In fact, uh, you know, the WHO said the CRP is 50. What if it is 45? Is Missy ruled out? No. What if it is 60? Is Missy confirmed? No. What if antibody is positive? Missy is Missy confirmed? No. So Missy is a, entirely a clinical diagnosis of exclusion, which has to be made by an experienced pediatrician. But as you would have seen, in fact, I didn't have time to talk about IAP protocols. The IAP protocol, we had a lot of discussion. Dr. Tanu Singhal also was there in the discussions. We put up a statement saying that if there is a doubt, you refer to an expert, bar pediatric rheumatologist, bar infectious disease expert. I think that is true for difficult cases. In fact, we have had a Diagnosis of Missy initially, ultimately turning out to be typhoid fever or tuberculosis or dengue or scrub typhus. But I remember one, in one of our cases where we had admitted as Missy with CRP of 100, the junior most first year PG picked out the SHR in the scrotum. We didn't investigate further. We gave only doxycycline, the fever crashed. I think it's, it's pure clinical judgment. Missy is one more reminder to clinicians like you and me that it is good history and physical examination, of course, supported by rational investigations, which is going to take you to the finish. Thank you, sir. 100% I agree with you. Anybody with a bald head and a white mustache will agree with you. But clinical examination, completely poor rules the laboratory misleads. When we also had a child admitted as a Missy, there would be a culture positive entry fever. So it's all we have seen that so happening. Uh, uh, some more questions for Dr. Um, um, <clears throat> Raman. And before that, uh, uh, to Dr. SBS, sir, the child, CRAD is a really attractive option for a very costly IVAG. But a child got admitted on day three of fever with a CRP of 100, 100 or 200, where we can't exclude any of this. All the cultures are going to be available for us for next 48 hours only. Is it safer to start steroids? That is a big thing. The answer many is, of the investigations, including streptifers, all the investigations may not be available immediately for us. It will definitely take at least 48 hours. This dilemma... Is not, I'm not questioning you. I'm just telling my difficulty. You are asking an extremely relevant and important question. Right now in the hospital ward today, I went for rounds before joining the session. There is a child who's two year old, who was admitted yesterday with the fourth day of fever, not given any antibiotics outside, with rashes from day three, questionable chelitis, no glossitis, no conjunctivitis, Rashes, which I showed in the presentation, okay. almost like articarial wheels over the face and limbs, no itching, fever 105, CRP 150, counts normal, platelets low normal, antibody positive, echo normal, D dimers high, BNP borderline elevation. And yesterday I started on septraxone, doxycycline. I was so confident about the diagnosis, I stopped septraxone, doxycycline and started IVIG and methyl prednisolone. Morning, the lab has called me and told me gram negative bacilli is growing. <laughs> I restarted septraxone. I reduced the dose of methyl prednisolone from 10 milligram per kg. That's the usual thing we give. We do one to two milligram. We have completed IVIG. The parents are angry. I don't know. I mean, this is a dilemma which is going to be there. I think in a sick child who has got hypotension, who goes into ICU, fulfills the criteria of Missy, I don't think you or me will have the guts to withhold antibiotics. Thank you. Definitely. Start up culture. I always believe that there are two troubles. One is starting trouble, another is stopping trouble. Stopping. <laughs> you decide to start, okay? Stop if you are convinced it is Missy and infections are ruled out. Otherwise, you continue. But in a sick child, it is a difficult decision. 
it is basically a clinical judgment in fact uh, i often tell uh, the, the, in my discussions dr ramanan we always say we can't offer tailor made solutions for every case which is going to come to our practice but these children i have not read the lit covid then they are not going to present you the classic missy way so it's essentially a holistic clinical judgment you should think twice before starting high dose steroids or for that matter steroids and the what you call threshold for antibiotics should be low in missy that's my comment sir uh, um, rajendran can we have another 5 minutes sir uh, because yeah. you look very anxious you look very anxious yeah go that's a yes per icmr report hmm. almost 60% children have antibodies how will be used covid antibody in diagnosis of missy dr sadish kumar from uh, cmc yeah, that's what is going to confuse us yeah very very simple answer you must remember the who criteria does not mandate that you must have a covid antibody positivity for diagnosis it is essentially a clinical diagnosis antibody positive or negative it is clinical diagnosis based on the algorithm given and the algorithm is i am afraid is not perfect we are going to see like kawasaki incomplete missy complete missy atypical missy and we will have refinement of these criteria as more and more data emerge you must also remember holistically that one third of kawasaki may have associated infections we still do not know what percentage of missy have associated infections we do not know so antibody positive or negative Now going to change the diagnosis. A diagnosis and a holistic diagnosis. That's why I said I like this disease. See, unfortunately, with us, the, all the old diseases are staying with us: tuberculosis, malaria, typhoid, scrub typhus. New diseases are getting accumulated. Nobody is vacating the room. So that's so why we have a lot of problem making a diagnosis. We have to do a lot of investigation, a lot of treatment. Confusing us compared to the, compared to those in UK and Western country, they have only one or two diseases. That is the problem with us. Uh, there is a question this. for uh, Dr. Ramanan. Uh, Dr. Ramanan asked this: RCT, you are able to do so much of RCT in such large numbers. Any suggestions for us, Indian colleagues, to imitate you and how we can make it possible? yeah i i think um, probably one of the biggest success stories in covid was that we have recruited 45000 adults and almost all major do's and don'ts of drugs which work and don't work it's because we have a single healthcare provider everybody is under the government healthcare system and at the start of the pandemic the government said that uh, through the chief medical officer that you can only access drugs through the hospital almost always in a trial so if you wanted tocilizumab you had to be in a trial and you have to accept that you will have a 50% chance of not getting it that was your only way for every drug apart from oxygen and uh, supported care and i think so much could have been done if we had a network of hospitals and there was clear direction because the numbers in india you would have answered all these questions in one month if, because but Uh, i think i didn't hear anything uh, about mucormycosis from you mucormycosis no i i explained that even though one third of the adults of the 40000 had diabetes diabetic only. we didn't see the same prevalence of mucor in uk so just to say it's because of diabetes is not possible so i have three possible explanations for which i haven't got evidence one is a putative that whether the virus was destroying some in an immune mediated process the pancreas leading to new onset diabetes which was resulting in the mucor the second is indiscriminate use of steroids i don't have any evidence for that and the third is poorly controlled existing diabetes we probably had in the whole country only less than 10 cases of mucor with, with so uh, it's inexplicable and i hope somebody looks into it in greater um, detail to why there is so much mucor in india but it needs a very say, careful investigation and just say just one thing i just uh, may I just congratulate professor raman for his lot of research work and i think it is it is lot it is given lot of useful information to the entire world i would say 
and i'm pleased to say that he was my college mate in stanley medical college thank you <laughs> dr ramana one question yeah. uh, regarding uh, misi management do you have any trial with uh, rct trial and dexa versus methyl prednisolone no but in the um, in our trial we gave equivalence so you we put a table you could use either methyl prednisolone or dexamethasone or hydrocortisone on equivalent doses um, we involved some pharmacologists who said that the dosing can be just extrapolated so we think if we show one works you can use any of the three there are some small benefits of dexa such as better cns penetration and so on but we don't think there's a big difference for the under one uh, under one month that is the infants and neonates with um, primary or covid or uh, missy which are very small numbers we used hydrocortisone because of the reluctance of neonatologists um, to use uh, steroids and, and and so we used hydrocortisone but they are all um, proportionate to the same dose so we did equivalent studies so much milligrams of dexamethasone equals so much of hydrocortisone equals so much of methylprednisolone ramana if i might add i don't think there is enough data to say that one is superior over the other theoretically methylprednisolone may have better lung penetration may work better in covid pneumonia but in your recovery trial you have used dexamethasone and shown results yeah. ultimately i don't think it is going to matter at all no i think dexamethasone and prednisolone and methylprednisolone are fairly comparable the differences are uh, very minimal in terms of the uh, mineralocorticoid effects so nothing that uh, should cause us any concern so you can use any of the dexamethasone and prednisolone are interchangeable hydrocortisone probably has got slightly different profile in terms of its mineralocorticoid activity in fact i always used to wonder ramanan you know several diseases 10 mg per kg mps 15 mg per kg mps 30 mg per kg have all these been arrived after rct or just after t t cup discussion you know the 10 to 30 there's no evidence base but i've said this before in my talks that low dose steroids work by a mechanism which is called genomic so when you give somebody 1 to 2 mg of steroids they bind to the steroid receptor the glucocorticoid receptor and then from there you will get down regulation of the pro inflammatory cytokines and up regulation of anti inflammatory cytokines but when you give 10 20 or 30 and we don't know what the right dose is we use 10 um, they work by a, a different mechanism which is called non genomic so we shouldn't confuse the dosing but whether you use 10 or 20 or 30 we have no evidence base but 10 is different to the way the mechanism of action is different to the way low dose steroids 1 to 2 per kilo work so the sps on the lighter side do you think somebody will start a certificate course or diploma course on covid like diabetes tuberculosis <laughs> are you have any idea of starting a certificate course on covid allergy thank god my god i i am only praying <laughs> i am only praying that the third wave doesn't come Mm. and our me, me as well as my hospital escapes from financial crisis all the pediatricians yeah 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 in fact uh, in fact in one of my presentations to the uh, to the star health insurance i showed a figure of an old man looking at the sun with the dry land waiting for rain is none other than a pediatrician because many young pediatricians are getting out of business in fact i read an article in medscape that uh, the maximum reduction in the professional fees to doctors has been amidst pediatricians they had also done a survey among young pediatricians 90% of them feel that the few that their future is bleak so if covid continues is going to be bad business for us um if i can come in for a minute yes sir yes yes sir radish uh, yes please sir excellent excellent lectures from both uh, dr bala and dr uh, ramnan dr ramnan you very briefly mentioned in the introduction of your talk about interferon and they, there is there are two genetic studies which are shown now that those who have either low interferon or those who have interferon antibodies are those who are predisposed for severe covid 
and especially in the younger age groups so has there been any study on the use of early interferon for high risk patients no i mean you're absolutely right we know that you're predisposed to getting severe respiratory covid if you are either blunted in your interferon response or if you have anti interferon antibodies and 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 you allude to the two studies which have been published the um there haven't been any studies um but there is as you know now jack kinase inhibitors work through the interferon pathways and now tofacitinib and baricitinib have both been shown to be very effective and i think um for respiratory covid at least in adults after the steroids jack inhibitors will become the next line of treatment and as you well know there's huge cost differential uh, tofacitinib and baricitinib a 14 day course will only cost you between 200 to 500 rupees compared to tocilizumab 8 mg per kilogram for a 70 kilo adult if you can access it is huge so uh, th- that's the only data we have nobody else has done any other interventions but i i think i come back to the point i said we'll understand more about kawasaki through miss c because there is a clear genetic predisposition we just haven't identified it because with 70% of the pediatric uh, age group children being positive as dr satish alluded to why is only a tiny proportion getting miss c must be a, a, a genetic predisposition chromosome 3 i i don't know to be honest so there was a, there was a there was a study which came out from yeah. the uk and from uh, the europe which showed that the, the predisposition for getting and getting more severe covid is located on chromosome 3 So yeah, some... I'll be. Yeah, no, it might be. I'd be cautious in drawing too many conclusions because they're all kind of early data. What we need is large scale, and so maybe in the next six months you'll have more clarity. The second question I had was regarding tuberculosis and uh, coronavirus. So because we have seen a huge surge of tuberculosis across India with in, in patients who are post COVID. is this because only because of lockdown and they didn't seek care or is it because there's an immune suppression secondary to covid i i can't answer that because i i lack the uh, the that exp- experience jagdish i will answer this question yeah i will answer this question somebody was walking on the marina beach on a sunday evening he saw 10 people out of which four were smoking ganja the next day he concluded that 40% of madrasis are ganja addicts i think such observations in fact in even in our own hospital we have had gross reduction in um, admissions but we have not seen much reduction in tb cases we have not seen much reduction in strep typhus mm-hmm. cases and enteric fever cases i think such hospital based data does not say anything in fact uh, from the national institute of research in tuberculosis they have submitted a project for studying the uh, uh, the comparison of uh, antibody and infection status of children with and without tuberculosis i think uh, only after such a study that will be known but it is postulated in a few case reports that covid can suppress t cell function and tuberculosis can manifest but it's very difficult to conclude that covid has been responsible for the simple reason you know different forms of tuberculosis have got different latent periods for example bone tuberculosis presence after 7 8 years or 6 years renal tuberculosis 10 to 15 years endometrial tuberculosis 15 years so i think just by seeing number few i mean a marginal increase in numbers to blame it on covid without data you may be right but there is no evidence in literature so that's why i'm asking there for evidence there is no evidence today okay dr sadish kumar uh, cmc bello do you have any data regarding the same uh, cases dr sadish satish 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 are you available satish Right. Muted, Satish. Ah, your MIC data and your comments. Actually, they have published their MIC data in uh, Indian pediatrics. So, sir, that is the last year's data we have published. 
this year's data we are just doing observation study by using our protocol so once it's all the study is over we will publish in that okay great i am sure they will do yeah probably how many cases that studies we are having this year so okay. this year we have we have we are almost 70 sir 70 okay. yeah, this one i want to tell you satish yes sir when presented the data in the lancet commission discussion the data that he showed was far different from the data we had most of the cases you had all seen uh, have been very severe with uh, quite a few deaths and uh, most of the severe covid have been in immunocompromised children whereas in our hospital that we have data on immunocompromised children they have all done so well no uh, the, no direct deaths due to covid 19 in fact 260 positive children hospitalized only two deaths and both the deaths were due to non covid morbidity one was an acute myocardial leukemia dying of tumor um, tumor lysis syndrome another was an undetected vasculitis who died of renal failure whereas you in your series you had seen of course it may be something to do with the referral bias of your institution which sees large number of chronic the patients coming there i in fact i i was even asking winsley about it he presented the very interesting data from your institution in the lancet commission which showed that large number of children had succumb because of underlying illness due to covid yes sir so most of them are our hematology patients few of them are post yes. transplant patients that's a data winsley would have showed you almost nine children they are not most of them does not die because of the primary covid as you correctly said just one brief question there are two questions in the chat box one is uh, like uh, whether evv can be can also lead to mic yeah, there are any scope to study like uh, the covid whether evv can lead to mic that is one question second question is uh, what is the influence of uh, hiv whether it is mutual acceleration or deceleration of hiv by covid so covid and hiv yeah i i don't know the hiv one we haven't got any uh, data to answer that the ebv we already know ebv can give um, a hemophagocytic syndrome ebv hlh is well recognized in fact rituximab is is used so i'm not sure it gives a multi system inflammatory syndrome but it gives more a hemophagocytic syndrome in terms of um, long covid um, people are looking at ebv is well recognized to give chronic fatigue syndrome and people are looking at the role of sars cov2 for a similar uh, long covid uh, our own hospital is running a long covid clinic but it will take months if not years before we get some clarity on what the incidence prevalence is so can i just ask you a brief question ah yes go ahead sure. um, um just i want to make dr winsley mentioned in his lecture that about 30 ileum in ileum 30% of ace receptors are there If that is the case. I would expect to see more of GS symptoms even in adults. I just want to ask Professor Ramanan also whether do you have any sort of you know outcomes just based on the symptom methodology like GS symptoms do better than those who present respiratory anything like that? No, um, we don't see much miss what people call as miss A, which is multi-system inflammatory syndrome in adults. There is a small number of adults who get uh, uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. They tend to be between the ages of 18 to 30 so um the why don't we get abdominal symptoms in primary covid in adults is not clear and i don't think you can go just by ace distribution and symptomatology uh, the multi system inflammatory syndrome is not necessarily correlated with ace uh, receptor distribution thank you one last question uh, dr sir can you use baricitinib in children usage of baricitinib in children yeah so um we are running the trial from age 2 so the short answer is yes from about 2 you have data but that's only for primary covid not for miss c so if you have a 15 16 year old 80 kilo adolescent who comes in positive with um, um for pcr positive is an oxygen requirements and you've given dexamethasone then i think it's appropriate to treat him like an adult and give him baricitinib or her baricitinib Uh, before concluding our uh, dma dr narayana babu sir is there i think i invited dr narayana babu sir to come and dr narayana babu sir hari sir dr narayana babu sir 
is muted rajendra is muted yeah muted sir muted yeah. okay sir uh, shall we conclude sir yeah it's wonderful talk both at sbs and uh, ev ramanan we learned a lot a lot of new things wonderful sir even though the time uh, exceeded we in fact uh, we stuck to the chair to listen to every slide of both the sbs as well as ev ramanan it was very very useful talk practically useful one and also a lot of uh, interactive discussion which has thrown light on practical things thank you very much uh, at sbs for organizing such a wonderful cme on covid update when is the next covid update <laughs> <laughs> in the way in which uh, uh, progressing thank you. thank you thank you dr rajendran <laughs> and ismail for uh, giving me the opportunity to organize and i have no words to express my gratitude to all my friends uh, who made this possible i am extremely uh, sorry uh, as you all know i am i am a stickler to <laughs> timing i hate uh, any delay in initiation as well as completion but it is unavoidable and i thank dr rajendran for having it. in fact the the function which is organized is, is very much necessary for iap and for tamil nadu thank you very much for organizing it so well dr rajendran